notorious for untangling these things. Let me just try. What? Back behind me. Turn it up. Oh, okay. Um. Oh. I can't do it. It's Is that better? Okay. I'll try to talk loud. Is that better? Is that working? Okay. Huh? Oh, I was just trying to make sure which mic you were trying to use. Yeah, if we turn that one off. Okay. Is this better? Yes. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. I, I have an aversion to podiums, so. Um, my name is Osla Roloff. I direct the Immigrant Women Program at Legal Momentum. And I have, I started my career actually, we were talking earlier, I started my career as a family lawyer and began doing this work when I discovered that um, I, I, I had the privilege of working for a judge named Gladys Kessler, who's now in the, the um, she's at the Federal Court of Appeal, or Federal District Court in DC, but at the time she was running the family division in DC Superior Court. And, um, as her law clerk, I learned domestic violence law, essentially, from her. And then my next job, they said, we'll hire you to do whatever you'd like as long as you speak Spanish. And so I began representing basically every domestic violence victim who spoke Spanish in the District of Columbia who needed to go to court for protection orders. And this was at a time where there were no interpreters in the court, no Spanish-speaking police officers. It was like living in the Wild West because I was the only person they could talk to, and so we would go out with the police. We'd do kind of full service everything. And then found myself in the early 90s as an attorney in Washington doing, at that point having many years of experience working with immigrant victims, being a co-founder of the National Network to End Violence Against Immigrant Women, and lucky enough to be part of the process of kind of bringing the kinds of information that you all are experiencing when you're seeing clients on a daily basis to Washington and actually was involved in helping create and draft the Violence Against Women Act immigration provisions, the UVs of the TVs of VAWA. So we're going to have a question and answer session as we go, and please raise questions. Feel free to uh, ask questions as we go, but I'm probably one of the few people who could actually tell you why things got written in such an odd way, and what got in and out and all of that. But I'm here today to kind of really talk to you about the immigration remedies that have been created for battered immigrants and immigrant victims of sexual assault and trafficking, and that you all can use as tools to help immigrant women from around the world um, that you see in your, you know, that you're working with. What I'd like to do is try, I know this is the not the best setup for it, but I want to try to get you involved a bit, and I'm going to be asking some questions and getting some audience feedback. Let me just start by saying, um, since it's after lunch, those of you who are um, therapists, can you stand up? I'm going to make you stand up. <laughs> therapists, okay. Great. How about um, domestic, domestic violence victim advocates? Got a good number of those. Great. Okay. Um, uh, attorneys? couple of us. <laughs> Great. Um, let me see. Uh, police officers, any law enforcement? Government? Law enforcement? Great. Um, prosecutors? Yay, we got one. <laughs> um, let me see. Other, uh, like general people that are doing uh, work in rape crisis centers, let's say? Anybody working with sexual assault victims? Um, Community programs that are working with immigrant or ethnic minority community-based organizations. A few of those. Great. Did I miss somebody? Yes. Social workers. Social workers. <laughs> and outreach. Uh, outreach. Right. And, uh, ambulatory care. Ambulatory care. So healthcare providers, healthcare professionals. Fantastic. Good. So we have a good mix. Many of you are seeing people at various different instances. My goal in this first half of the presentation is to help you get a sense of 
who qualifies for what kinds of immigration relief. So that if you're working with an immigrant victim, you have a sense of, because with immigration relief comes generally, and we'll be talking about this tomorrow, access, increased access to public benefits to a certain extent, comes the ability to get legal, legal work authorization, comes the ability, although it's not a matter of law, and you'll be talking about that later, um, to sometimes get a better deal in family court because the abuser, can, if, you're, if you have legal status, may not be as effective in trying to get the court to um, use immigration status as a factor, let's say, in a custody decision. And I know there were some questions about custody this morning that we're planning on trying to talk a little bit more at the end of the conversation today. So, first thing I wanted to do is let you know about some technical assistance resources that are available. And first of all, um, I started a new thing literally two weeks ago. I've been doing like, I've been in a different city almost every week. But what I'm going to do is this PowerPoint, we will post it on our website. So if you go under iwp.legalmomentum.org, you'll come to a resource library. And if you type in Indianapolis, you will find the presentation. <laughs> and you can download it from our web. That's easier than trying to hassle with distributing it and then, but it'll make it available to you that way. So you don't have to scribble furiously. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And that we also provide technical assistance. There's a place on the website for which if you're working with a client and you have questions about family law, immigration, public benefits, language access, you can send us an email that is confidential. We will have one of our attorneys get back to you and answer the question. And then that also has, we have frequently asked questions on the website as well so that some of the questions we've gotten on technical assistance, you can actually look up the answers on our website. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you about and invite you to think about is we co-direct the National Network to End Violence Against Immigrant Women and that is an organization of roughly 3,000 groups across the country and individuals ranging from you know, former people that used to work at DHS, former and current police officers to victim advocates to um, we have researchers, attorneys, immigrant rights, women's rights, domestic violence, sexual assault groups. And so if you are interested, um, if you could bring me your card and write network on it and we'll send you a sign-up sheet and there's a way to get involved in listservs and other things that'll provide you up-to-date information as the laws and changes and policies that happen around immigrant victims. Um, why is immigration status important? Why does it matter? Somebody? Yeah? So you said child services? You said it can be, it, what services you can get if, as a child, for example, would depend on your immigration status? Yep. Why else is it important? Yeah? Part employment? Yeah? Right, so some, the power and control over, over immigration status is a tool that a crime perpetrator and abuser can use, and if I know that I can call the police for help and I'm not going to be deported, or to, that call the police or that walking into the hospital isn't going to end up with me being reported to the Department of Homeland Security, then I'm more likely to come forward and get help, absolutely. Other things that might help? Why else might somebody want legal immigration status? Okay, let's see. It severs the it severs the dependence on, on abusers. Um, it helps people be protected not only from deportation but detention. And I'll be talking. There's brand new um, policies out of the Department of Homeland Security, August twentieth, two thousand and ten, about that point. Um, it can help. You get better access to family court, as I said, and ultimately it's, a, it's, a, it's an avenue towards lawful permanent residency, which is permanent, the ability to live permanently in the United States. And once you get lawful permanent residency, with that comes an ability to travel. Many of you will be working with victims, I'll tell you right up front, um, that'll get VAWA immigration relief or a U visa, but their ability to travel internationally to, say, if their mother's dying and they want to leave the country, is still extremely limited. Um, there may be ways to do it depending on which status, but it's a big problem for a lot of immigrants. And VAWA, unfortunately, in U visas doesn't really solve it, right? Right. Okay. I'm just checking. <laughs> she practiced more immigration law. Than me. Okay. Um, 
And that the reason it's important to know about immigration status is it helps you better work with your clients. It also keeps you from unwittingly doing something in, in, in where, that you think is going to be helpful, like getting a woman a divorce from an abuser, that may actually cut off immigration status. So for example, um, if I have a client who comes to me and her husband's filed for divorce, first thing I want to know is does she have any kind of an immigration visa that's tied to him? Or has he ever filed papers for her? If he's filed, let's say, papers to get her a visa through the regular family-based immigration system, and the interview with the Department of Homeland Security is the day after the divorce is final as opposed to the day before, the day before, she gets lawful permanent residency along with him. The day after, she gets nothing. So in, when there's a divorce pending, it's really important to know that somebody is an immigrant and whether their status might be affected by his. So that's something you want to be aware of. Um, and that the other thing is, is the other reason it's important for you to know this, is that we know immigrant women talk to women. And many of you are doing community outreach and working in communities and that have, an, have the ability to educate women about the relief that's available. Um, one thing I wanted to tell you on our website, we also have, I believe they're up. I have to check. But we did a Are You Safe at Home brochure. And I think it might be on your CD. But it's available in Spanish, English, obviously, Russian, Hindi, Gujarati, and Arabic in, um, on our website. And so they're materials for victims, but it's also really good for um, people who are advocates who want a sh short description. It's a good summary of the immigration relief we'll be talking about and the, and the family law and benefits reliefs. So what happens is, is you should know that anybody who's not a citizen has certain has some rights in the immigration system. And I know, you know, when you read in the paper and you listen to the media, it sounds like they don't, but they do. They have a right to be represented by an attorney. They have a right to ask for a hearing before an immigration judge. And with any battered immigrant you're looking for looking to work with, it's important that you tell her that. That no matter what happens, she should ask for an attorney, have the number of an attorney, you should have relationships in your community with people who can help her. Um, and that if she has a case filed before immigration, with immigration that's pending, that is a VAWA, T, or U visa case, which I'll be talking about, it's super important to work with your client to hide the number. There's a number on every, anybody can tell me what the number of an immigration case starts with? Par pardon? I. Not I. It's a letter. No. Nope. It's A. They're called A numbers. So anybody that the case number in immigration starts with an A. And so if your client files an immigration case under any of these recipe, re recipes, remedies, I'm thinking of cooking, right? Um, any of these remedies, um, she will have a number that starts with an A. The reason that number is important, she should memorize it, carry it with her, because if she's stopped by DHS, and she says, I have a U visa case, I have a VAWA case, and gives them the number. They're not supposed to detain or remove her. Okay, I'll get to that later. But it's really important from a safety perspective that if she has a number, she carries it with her, she memorizes it, she knows it. Because DHS, because of some of the VAWA confidentiality procedures I'm going to be talking about later, she's not going to show up in the immigration system, the, the immigration electronic record system of the ICE enforcement officer, the DHS enforcement officer that's trying to arrest her for being undocumented. So she needs to prove to them that she's eligible because it's not going to show up their system because they have overly protected the confidence. Not over. You can never give victims too much confidentiality protection, but this is a, a problem with the system right now. Okay. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go over the various forms of immigration relief that immigrant victims of violence against women could be eligible for. And they're divided in two categories. The ones on top, the first one, two, three, four, five, are um, what we call affirmative relief. And basically what it means is that the immigrant victim walks into the Department of Homeland Security and basically says, I'm here, I'm illegal, and I'm eligible for relief. So she's essentially turning herself into a ply. Okay? That she applies, she doesn't have to be arrested, she doesn't have to go before an immigration judge, but it's something she chooses to apply for. The other forms of remedies at the bottom, the last two, are 
an immigration relief that if she gets that some victims qualify for, mostly domestic violence victims, pretty much domestic violence victims qualify for, that helps them if they get put into immigration court proceedings because their abuser made a call, because there was a raid on their workplace. They can get there for a variety of reasons. But one of the things that we're seeing is that the Department of Homeland Security, now that they've been pouring so much money into immigration enforcement, there are people sitting by the phone. So when the sexual assault perpetrator employer calls because he thinks the victim might be calling up the EEOC to try to exercise her rights, or may talk to somebody about the sexual abuse, um, they show up in a way that, I mean, I did this family law for 17 years. Almost every case, the abuser threatened to turn her into DHS, but nobody ever came. But now, with the resources they have, it's a much more serious victim safety issue than it had been in the past, these kinds of threats. Um, okay. So I'm going to start, actually, I'm going to start with, I'm going to talk for a second before I go on about the battered spouse waiver. Yes? Could you go through the anachronisms, the VA? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to do that in a minute, but that's good. No, no, no. You're right. Uh, catch me, please. I try not to speak in numbers and letters. DHS is the Department of Homeland Security. And the Department of Homeland Security, I don't know where the slide is, I'll show it to you later, is got three branches that are responsible for immigration writ large. One is called um, Citizenship and Immigration Services. They're the people that decide who gets visas. They give legal status to people. They give naturalization to people. Um, on the other side, there are two organizations. One is called um, citizenship. Uh, one is called um, immigration and customs enforcement, and the other is called border patrol. And a lot of people will always talk about. You'll hear immigration people talking about ICE, 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 this, ICE, that, whatever. That she's like, yeah. <laughs> What they mean is, I try to use the term immigration enforcement because even in Indiana, I suspect, and you'll correct me if I'm wrong, in most states, you have immigration officers that work for immigration customs enforcement working, but you also, at your airports, for example, international airports, will have customs and border patrol. In a border state, they're going to be having a lot more customs and border patrol involved in enforcement, but I talk about them generically as immigration enforcement officers because they really, vis-a-vis -vis the victims we're talking about, have the same function. They're the people whose job it is is to arrest and detain un undocumented immigrants, people who are not, don't have legal permission to be in the United States. Does that help? And then the T and U, which are, I'm going to go through. They're forms of immigration relief. Let me just go through it quickly. There's something called the Violence Against Women Act self-petition, VAWA self-petition. That is a form of immigration relief available to people who, the way I think about it is, um, people whose abusers are their US citizen or lawful permanent resident, spouses, former spouses, or children. Or, in, in any of you deal with elder abuse at all? Okay. In elder abuse context, you can have a U.S. citizen son or daughter, somebody over 21 years old, who has the legal right today to help their mother or father get legal immigration status, but may be using that status to um, control or perpetrate elder abuse against their parent. And so that person would also be a VAWA self petition. I'll go into more detail about that in a minute. But before I do, I want to talk about this first one, which is a battered spouse waiver. And you're right, it shouldn't say USC. I, that means a citizen. That's just United States citizen. I should edit all these things out, but I sometimes miss some. So what happens is, is in 1990, uh, or 1986, Congress passed an immigration law that decided, as a matter of federal immigration law, that every marriage was fraudulent. And that it was up to people who applied to prove that their marriage is legitimate. And so they set up a system by which, generally speaking, if I'm married to a US citizen and I'm, undoc and I'm from another country, I get married and my husband, ideally, immediately files for immigration papers for me. Um, and what happens is, is if when I show up with my husband to the interview, 
Um, I meet with an immigration official who tries to f separate us and ask all these questions, very intimate questions, to figure out if we really know each other and love each other and if it's a legitimate marriage. And then what they'll do is if on the day I'm there, I'm married one year, 11 months, and five days, not two years, something under two years, they hand me what's called a conditional green card. It's a conditional lawful permanent residence document. And so the way, the reason I'm telling you all these details is what you really need to walk away with is if you're working with somebody that has a case in the system, has had contact with the Department of Homeland Security or has filed something, you want, and they have a card, you want to ask to see it. Because if you look at the card, and the card expires two years after it was issued, you hit the jackpot. You're in luck. It's the easiest kind of immigration case that those of us that work with immigrant victims can help the victim get. Because she has a temporary card, and what that means is if she's abused, and she's with you because she's a victim of domestic violence, she will be able to file papers immediately with the Department of Homeland Security documenting the validity of her marriage and that she was battered or subject to extreme cruelty by her spouse. And she will be able to get full lawful permanent residence without waiting two years and without the abuser's cooperation. Okay? So somebody might come to you and say, I can't leave him because I won't get my green card. He says he has to sign some papers. If he says that to you, this is a battered spouse waiver, and she can file, and she doesn't have to stay with him for two years. She can still get full lawful permanent residence without his knowledge, cooperation, or assistance. Okay? So that's the first one. But what happened was, historically, Congress also actually thought when they wrote that law in 1990, they were finished, that they helped everyone. Not true. Um, and so in 1994, they created VAWA self-petitioning, Violence Against Women Act self-petitioning. And this is based upon the um, regular family law visa process. So people who are married to a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident, if that U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident never filed papers for them, and they, they used the fact that they didn't file as a control to control the victim, the self-petition allows a victim to file her own immigration case, again, without the abuser's knowledge, assistance, or even con or consent. And so in order to win that case, if, if he were to file for her, all he'd have to prove is there's a valid marriage. He'd only have to prove this last one, good faith marriage, okay? She has to prove all the stuff above in order to self-petition. And that includes battery extreme cruelty. I'll talk about what that is in a minute. Um, she has to prove that he is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. How many of you do safety planning when you're working with victims? Okay. One of the things you want to talk, think about is when you know, or, or you want to find out early, if you can, whether a victim is potentially a non-citizen. Because if she's undocumented and she's battered, then she qualifies for this relief. But one of the things she's going to have to do is prove that he's a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. And it's easier to do that before she separates from him. So remember that A number I told you about a minute ago? So I've trained, literally, my clients. I pull it out and I show them what the green card looks like and I say, go get this number. <laughs> you know, sometimes when he's in the shower, he's sleeping, he's off to work, when it's safe, write down the number. Or get a copy of his passport. Or do, you know, something when you're safety planning or you're getting a protection order and you're ordering him to turn over things, you, you want to be sure that she can, if she can safely get evidence that he's a citizen or lawful permanent resident, it's going to make this much easier. Okay? So, <clears throat> She has to also prove that she resided for him for some period of time. Now, I know there were some visitation questions earlier today. Um, visitation counts. So if, in fact, you know, she has the, the child abuse, ha the, somebody's a victim of child abuse, and the abuser is somebody they have overnight visitation with, that's sufficient. It can be for any length of time. Obviously, the shorter the marriage, for example, the harder it is to prove. So longer marriages um, are fairly easy. What, can anybody tell me, I have to wake you guys after lunch. Anybody tell me what you think is the best evidence that DHS loves of a valid marriage? Children, exactly. How many of you, I know this happened to me and it probably happened to you too, how many of clients who are married to 
U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident abusers who say, honey, you only married me for the papers. Anybody ever heard that? Of course. And, but they said, and I had clients who really believed it, even though, you know, they had three kids, you know, seven, nine, and 12. And they really believed when they came to me that he was going to not be, she was not going to get her papers because she only married him for her papers. Well, if they have kids, you really don't have to worry about that. I mean, she, she can prove that very easily. It's the shorter marriages, the places where they don't have kids, that it's harder to prove. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so she has to have resided for some time, and she has to be a person of good moral character. And one of the things I think is most important for you to walk away with, if you can, from this, is if you have an immigrant client, a non-citizen client, and this is true of all non-citizens, even people with lawful permanent residency, some immigrant women get real, some battered women get really frustrated, they can't get help, and they start fighting back. If you're working with a non-citizen woman, it is super important that she does not, that you do everything you can in working with her to make sure she doesn't get criminal convictions. If she gets criminal convictions, the immigration case becomes much, much worse. And what the Department of Homeland Security is looking for here is she has to prove good moral character. And good moral character basically means they take her fingerprints or they look at her criminal record and she doesn't have one. Now, if she has a criminal record, this is a case where she absolutely needs a good immigration lawyer from the Julian Center or elsewhere. Because it's not that the victim can't win her case or it's a question of what kind of immigration relief she qualifies for. And it, that is a complex analysis based on what waivers or remedies are available to which kinds of victims with which kinds of status based on what she did. She killed somebody, it's going to be really hard. If she shoplifted baby food, it's probably not so hard. Especially if she shoplifted baby food, try and flee her abuser. Okay? Um, so what, you know, here it says battering or extreme cruelty. We all know more or less what battering is. We have protection order laws. I can tell you as to battering, whatever is covered in your state protection order law is enough for immigration. However, immigration will also help if she's subject to extreme cruelty. And this is the list that the Department of Homeland Security uses when they're trying to decide whether there's evidence of extreme cruelty. Can anybody in this room tell me what it kind of sort of looks like? What, what? what it kind of sort of looks like. Domestic Pardon? Domestic violence. Domestic violence what? Our the wheel. <laughs> That's what it actually is, more or less. It's an adaptation of the power and control will. They've gone to the research that supports how we, as advocates, look at the power and control will and work with women, and they are basically using this as a checklist to try to find evidence of extreme cruelty. And the reason Congress included an extreme cruelty in among the remedies, why it wasn't just battering like our protection order stat statutes or battering or th criminal threats or whatever, is they didn't want to mandate the first incident of physical violence. They wanted to, because these are cases where the abuser could have filed the immigration case himself. These are people with visas waiting for them. And they never got them because the abuser didn't file. And so they decided that they would allow it to happen, both for the battered spouse waiver and this, upon findings of extreme cruelty. Okay? Um, and these are some of the kinds of factors that correlate strongly. The research, these are the kinds of things that the research has found are particularly indicative of extreme cruelty or that violence may be escalating, et cetera, for immigrant victims. And I want to talk for a minute about the immigration-related abuse. One of the things I, earlier today, uh, I think the first speaker was talking a little bit about lethality and how we know, you know, how in domestic violence we're trying to find out how do we counsel victims and help them figure out what is the chances that this violence may be escalating. And one of the things the research has told us when we look at cross-culture at immigrant victims is that we find that, these, that abusers who use threats of deportation, threats to deport her, I'm going to file papers, I'm going to withdraw papers, I'm going to call DHS, I'm going to turn you in if you don't do X, that that appears to be a lethality factor. And what, it, the, what the research tells us is it's 10 times higher in re relationships that are physically or sexually abusive than relationships that are only emotionally abusive. 
And so if you're working with an immigrant victim and you're getting, she's telling you stories about him threatening to deport her, you know one of two things. Either that story is corroborating the abuse that she's telling you about, internally corroborating, like those of us in the old days, you remember the cut telephone cords? The abuser who would cut off the telephone so she couldn't call. It's the same kind of thing. Um, and then if there really, if, if there are any experience extreme cruelty at that time, the chances are that the abuse is escalating in the relationship. So it's important to know that as a service provider in terms of working with victims. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, divorce can be a problem. A battered immigrant has within two years of divorce to file for VAWA self-petitioning. A child abuse victim has until they turn, the abuse has to have happened before they turn 21, but they have up until they turn 25 to file. So as those of you working in child abuse may see teen victims or young adult victims who are um, undocumented and maybe abused by their father or, or you know something like that, and they still can file. Um, and what's very important here is that the other thing is is that um, those of us in family law don't think of this this way, but this covers stepchildren. So mom could be undocumented, married to a U.S. citizen stepdad, and stepdad abuses her undocumented child, the child's covered. Even if mom's not abused, even if it's only the child, because the step-parent relationship is sufficient, as long as there's no divorce. Um, and the other thing that's important before I go on to the U visa is that um, here there's no police report required, no cooperation with police required, no protection orders required but helpful, medical records are not required but helpful. You can prove your case any way, any credible way, no quantity of injury is required. And what happens is, is when a victim has her case approved, she gets protection from deportation, she gets work, legal work authorization, and she gets the ability to apply for lawful permanent residency through the Violence Against Women Act. However, if her abuser, what happens is if her abuser is a US citizen, she can file immediately. If her abuser is a lawful permanent resident, she has to wait seven years before she can file for lawful permanent residency. So she can't travel abroad. She's kind of stuck here for seven years, but she's stuck here with protection from deportation, some access to public benefits, and legal work authorization. So it's not horrific. Um, okay. So that is VAWA, self-petitioning. That's for people married to US citizens or lawful permanent residents, the children of US citizens or lawful permanent residents, and the parents of US citizens, adults. U.S. citizens, adults. So what happens to everybody else? I mean, how many of you have clients that don't fit that category? Probably almost everybody, right? At some point or another. So what happened was, in, there were a lot of, as, as people started seeing immigrant women coming forward because of the Violence Against Women Act immigration protections, what they also started seeing were women coming forward who couldn't be helped by immigration law. And as a result, in 2000, they passed um, new protections for immigrant victims. And they, the crime victim visa, which is a U visa, and the trafficking victim, which is a T visa. Now, everybody, sometimes people, like half the time, somebody raises their hand and say, why U? What does it stand for? Well, we tried to get them to skip U and give us V for victim, but they wouldn't do it. It was just the next letter up in the order when we were writing the law. So we haven't figured out how to say what U means, but it's U, and it's crime victims. Um, and so what happens here is this is broader than the violence. This is, now we're, we're stepping out away from domestic violence or in addition to domestic violence. And this is a visa that helps uh, victims of uh, criminal activity um, who have been, are likely to be, or are being helpful, helpful in criminal investigations and prosecutions. The abuse has to have happened in the United States um, and the victim has to have information about, the person applying has to have information about the crime. So criminal activity is underlined and the reason it's underlined is that Congress explicitly was trying to make sure that you didn't have to have a conviction of a crime before the victim could be helped. You wanted, the goal here was twofold. You wanted to encourage victims to come forward and report and be able to get protection so that abusers 
crime perpetrators against immigrants could get the relief, get, get protection so they could cooperate in the criminal prosecution. But co-equally, Congress wanted to give these victims whether or not there was a prosecution, because sometimes you know, you'll, how many of you have had clients who reported a rape and then there was never a prosecution or no of cases? Happens all the time, right. And so the goal here wasn't only to be able to get information about that rape when that person could be convicted. It was about building the evidence and build, getting people to come forward so that maybe the serial rapist will ultimately can be convicted. Maybe that perp, the domestic violence perpetrator will be convicted. But also to give all of the relief that VAWA, the Violence Against Women Act, was trying to give to victims of violence against women, domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, stalking. All of those forms of relief are by, by allowing U visa victims to be certified early when, they, when somebody identifies them as a victim, allows the victim to begin getting access to all those victim services that may ultimately make them, if they get to the point of that, a better witness at the criminal case. So they're linked, but separate. Okay. I go which way here? Nope. Okay. So these are all the crimes. So now we're in a world of crimes that is much broader than the VAWA self-petition, than domestic violence. It includes a whole range of um, sexual assault kind of crimes, crimes that happen in families, human trafficking, holding people hostage, um, blackmail extortion, obstruction of justice, a range of kind of crimes that are mostly violent but not totally. And it includes attempts, conspiracy, and uh, attempts and conspiracy to commit these crimes or any other similar activity. And the any other similar activity is in the statute because every state's criminal laws are different. And so if the elements of the criminal case are the same, are, are on this list, you can, the victim can qualify for a U visa. Okay. Yes? Yes. The victim of the crimes. Sometimes it'll be, there's no relationship required. So in VAWA, you have to be a, you know, the spouse or parent, or yeah, basically spouse, parent, or child. Here, there's no relationship. It could be a stranger, it could be an employer, it could be a family member, it could be the father in law. Good question. Good. Um, right, who's the murder victim? Right, so in immigration law with the U visa, the murder victim, in, for the U visa purposes, is considered to be, now I'm going to look at you and make sure I get this right, sure. um, it's, the, it's a close family member. So it's like if my parent was killed or my spouse was killed. Sister? Siblings? I don't I think siblings. No, I, I think it's immediate it's family relative. Or Children. child or, or maybe a parent. Right, child, parent, spouse is based. That is the one where, exactly right. That murder or manslaughter are the two where if the person's dead, it's the family member. And actually when you're working on U visa certifications with law enforcement and others, I'll get into that. This is a place where some people get really stuck. It's like, well, he's dead, there's no victim. And it's like, well, no. <laughs> and, and sometimes they can be a victim of, there can be other victims of attempted murder at the same time that there's a murder. So there was a case out in Virginia where I got a call once from a prosecutor who had like five undocumented immigrant witnesses who were all, it was domestic violence, I'll be right there, was all the domestic violence related and um, somebody did a shooting at a birthday party. And so some of the, the actual target wasn't shot. Two other people were killed and two other people were wounded. Well the wounded people are clearly victims and so was the target who was never shot. Because the person, one of the others that were killed was a spouse or child or husband or whatever. So that's kind of how it works. Yeah. I have a case where a five-year-old child was sexually assaulted. And we were able to get her visa. And she was granted her If the child is a U visa victim, her parents should be able to come in as, yeah. as family members. Well, but they may not have known. 
you know, the parents might not have understood that this could be an application for the whole family. Through who? I'm sorry. They sh they'd qualify. They would they qualify. Do qualify. I'm not sure why it was denied. If it was for another reason, I mean, I wouldn't be able to tell you without seeing right. the application itself and the process. But they would qualify, even and, and if I may, yeah, even please. if um, the victim is a United States citizen and the parent is undocumented, they can the they would qualify through their child that is a U.S. citizen. Right. And that's actually why that you see both the same things in the Violence Against Women Act immigration protections and in U visa. In order to get at child abuse, one of the things Congress did was offer the relief to the parents. Because there was an understanding that you're not going to be able to help child abuse victims if their parents can't get protection. Or they can, you know, they can be harmed by whoever the perpetrator was for that. So yes, it should be covered. Um, and and just on that point, if you're ever working with somebody, I mean, one of the things you can... You had a question? Okay. Can you... Let me finish my sentence. I'll be right with you. If you're working with somebody who, um, in this situation where you think they qualify or you want to check, we have materials on our website that they can go to. There are DOJ, Office of Violence Against Women Approved, and they can get a list. And so they can get training materials that might help people make those determinations and avoid those problems in the future. Yes? Oh, good. Okay, FGM is female genital mutilation. Um, any of you working with African clients? Okay. It can come up. I mean, female genital mutilation has been actually a crime in the United States since 1996, but most people don't know. <laughs> and it happens within communities. So you may have a victim you know, a young girl, for example, who they're trying to do FGM on in the community, she would qualify under this as a crime. Or if she was a victim of FGM in the US, she would qualify. Yep. Um, thank you. Yeah, I'm trying to, good acronym, I, I should write it all out. <laughs> okay, so what happens is, is in order to apply for a U visa, the victim has to, um, the first step is you have to get a certification for a law, from an official, a government official, that basically states that this crime, criminal activity occurred, this is the person who's the victim, and this person has been helpful to me or is being helpful in the criminal investig... And it's, it, it's, they have to be helpful in detection, investigation, prosecution, sentencing, or conviction. And it's or. So they can be, for example, they could report the crime, which may be evidence of, you know, they're trying to help the police know that this crime occurred, and the police may decide not to prosecute or they don't have enough evidence, it doesn't matter. So it covers this range. Um, but you need to find a law enforcement officer, a prosecutor, a judge, an immigration official, the people earlier who worked at Child Protective or Adult Protective Services, you can be certifiers as well. To be a certifier, you have to be uh, you have to have a su supervisory capacity in your agency and be designated by the head of your agency. And if you're working inside an agency that is on this list, I encourage you to work to, you know, we have materials available on our website. If you type in toolkit, you'll get a toolkit for police and judges. Um, and we have a blended one for prosecutors and police. We're working on a prosecutor one. We don't have it yet. But <clears throat> it gives you information about certification and what the rules are so that you can encourage your agency to designate you if you're a supervisor or someone else that you work with in, on your, in your agency to be certifiers. It's super important because certifiers, yeah, under the way the law is written right now, hold the keys. If you can't get certification, your client, even in the murder case or the attempted murder case, can't get a U visa. So you have to be able to get certification to start the case. Um, and I talked about detection. These are the various different ways that victims cooperate. And the case starts with certification. And the certification is a small, the evidence in the certification is a small subset of what the victim has to prove. They have to prove the, uh, it's, it's what criminal activity occurred, um, how the victim was helpful, who the victim is, and who the perpetrator is, because it might be a family member. There are cases in which the, per the law says that the perpetrator can't like, make up, the perpetrator can't benefit from the victim's application. So if the perpetrator is my spouse, and he's beating me up and I get a U visa, he can't be as a spouse included in my petition. 
So the certification helps DHS know who's who and what's what in that respect. Um, after it's approved, the victim gets protection from deportation. That could happen potentially a little earlier. I'll be talking about it in a minute, and I'm, I'm going to. And then they get four years of a U visa. U visa is not permanent resident status. It's temporary. It's a four-year temporary visa. At the end of that four years, there are some victims who will qualify for lawful permanent residency. I'll go over that. But these are the things that the police would, or a certifying agency would put on, would note on the certification form. And these are the things that the victim has to additionally prove. So certification starts the case, but then she has to prove, she has to disclose her criminal history. She has to disclose her immigration law history. She um, needs to prove substantial physical or emotional harm. Um, and she needs to prove that she was cooperative or helpful, among other things. So it's, it's a, the certification, some uh, law enforcement officials have been training a lot of law enforcement recently, think that if I sign the certification, I'm giving somebody citizenship. Far from it. Um, you sign a certification, the certification starts the process, but then the victim has a lot more to prove to get her visa. And even if she gets the visa, it could be, um, in order to get lawful permanent residency, she has to prove either that she cooperated, in any prosecution or investigation, or that she didn't unreasonably refuse to cooperate. And even if she shows, meets those tests, she will only get a green card under this if she can show humanitarian need, family unity, or public interest. And I'll give you an example of what each of those are. Um, humanitarian need, let's take a case of uh, two people from Guatemala. And they're both undocumented, and he's abusing her, and she um, cooperates, and he gets convicted and then deported to Guatemala based on the domestic violence conviction. He's now waiting for her. She has a humanitarian need to remain in this country that comes out of her cooperation in the case. That's humanitarian need. Family unity. How many of you have worked with young immigrants who are undocumented and came over with their family as little kids? Yeah, there's a number of you. And so, I see he nods, heads nodding. Family unity, many, many immigrant families, about 85% of immigrant families, are what we call mixed status family. You might have somebody who has a citizenship, somebody who has lawful permanent residence, somebody who's undocumented, somebody who has temporary protected status, somebody who's a asylee, you don't, they're all, all mixed up. If somebody can show that, look, their life is here, their family is here, this is the language they speak, they've been here, this is where their family is because they grew up here, that's family unity. Yep? Absolutely. Absolutely. They can, without regard to whether the pros there's ever a prosecution that comes out of that. In particular, what happened was, let me go back. Where is it? Yeah, there. If you notice, many of the, um, except for the military and university police, most of the people in the bottom part are groups, are, are people whose part of their job is to investigate criminal activity. So for example, in a child abuse or adult protective services case, you could have crimes occurring that are never prosecuted, but are the fundamental basis and that worker's job is to dig into the facts and figure out whether those actions that could be criminal activity occurred for the abuse and the neglect case, right? So if that's your job, that's why, similarly, the EEOC doesn't prosecute rape in the employment setting. They'll prosecute sex discrimination or sexual harassment as a result of, or sexual assault, but it's in the context of the employment. And what the Congress did was they understood that people may seek a range of remedies that may not ultimately be the conviction for the child abuse or the conviction for elder abuse or the conviction for rape. And so they, the statute and the regulations explicitly state that child protective services workers, EEOC, labor departments at the state, um, and other similarly situated government officials like elder abuse people can certify as well. Same rules apply as to the police. Yes? Could 
They, they can't serve, no. It has to be a government person. So faith leaders, other kinds of service providers aren't part of this. The, they, they wanted somebody who part of their job is like to find probable cause, like police. I mean, it, part of their job is to figure out whether crimes are occurring. And so this is as far as it's gone so far. Um, but that's, that's who qualifies. But there's a range because the local police might not do it. It might be the prosecutor or the child abuse investigator do it, not the police. I mean, you, the idea was to have multiple options that would get you in the door. Um, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay. So basically, um, I guess what I would say is the last one is public interest. The public interest example is you have a serial rape case in the community. The person who can actually identify the suspect and who gives the DNA that matches it and then they start unraveling the whole thing happens to be an undocumented immigrant and she's the star witness in a prosecution. DHS has the ability in the, in, in the, when she's seeking lawful permanent residency to say, you know, she's been through enough, we're not going to put her through anymore, we're going to give her a green card. So it's a discretionary kind of general public interest category. And I have in the materials a list of red flags, which are things that make it harder for victims to get immigration relief. I'm going to go faster because I'm going to run out of time here. Um, I also have in your materials this comparison, and I think it helps you see kind of how VAWA and the U visa differ, and how some people will qualify for both, and how they, it might help you help them choose which one's better for them. Um, I'm going to lastly talk about the T visa and then close with some new information on immigration detention and removal. Um, in addition to the U visa, there's something called the trafficking victim visa, a T visa. And that's a, vi a visa for a person who is a victim of sex trafficking, where there has been force, fraud, or coercion, or the person is under the age of 18, or where there has been labor trafficking, in which the recruitment, harboring, transportation, or provision of, uh, uh, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion is part of the pattern of abuse. Um, and they can be for purposes of uh, involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage, or slavery. And the, when you think of trafficking, the easiest way to think about it is you have to find three things. What was the process? Was somebody recruited, harbored, or were they obtained? And what I mean by that is sometimes it doesn't involve crossing a border. Sometimes somebody crossed the border with a smuggler and ends up going to take a job as a waitress at a bar and ends up locked up in a house of prostitution. And she can't leave. She's obtained. So that's the process. The means is force, fraud, or coercion. You told me I was, you know, was going to be a waitress and now I'm a prostitute, for example. Um, but it also could be you told me, you know, that I was going to work eight hours and you lock me in and I can't get out until I've worked 20. And I don't have a job when I come back tomorrow. If I, if I don't come back tomorrow and put up with this. Um, and then the end has to be involuntary servitude, debt bondage, slavery, or sex trade. So that's kind of the big picture. Do you want to say anything else about the traffic? I was just going to stop there. No, I... I, I've only done a little bit of the sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's just I think now starting to be a little bit more popular in Indiana that we're starting to recognize it in Indiana. So I think it's important that we do keep our eyes open to right. see you know just little places, restaurants, um, um, nail shops, and places like that are very common to having victims. Right. And there are um, people can include their kids as well. Yes. Yes, unless they're under 18. Well, what's interesting is if you, I don't know if you noticed because there was a long list, trafficking is on the U visa list as well. So, you could be held hostage in a trafficking situation, and you might not be able to show, let's say, all three elements. So trafficking victims at kind of lesser levels where it's harder to make the, all of the TVs or requirements could file for use. 
So there's, and Congress designed it that way so that you'd have more multiplicity of options. Um, okay, let me see. And again, you have to have a reasonable, you have to, here you have a compliance with law enforcement requirement like you do in the U visa, but this is a little different. You have to require, you have to comply with reasonable requests. So it's a question of the reasonableness of the request from the prosecutor to you or the police to you. Whereas in U visa, it's whether in your decision not to cooperate was unreasonable. So they're slightly, the broader, the U visa is broader because it includes her safety. If she didn't cooperate because of victim safety, she might be fine. Okay. Um, victims get a whole bunch, trafficking victims get a whole bunch of services. We'll be talking about that tomorrow morning. Um, these are some good examples, and I don't know if they're in your, yeah, they should be in your printed slides, I, I think, of, of ways to screen for trafficking victims, but I'm going to skip those right now because I want to go over the last part, which is, and that's, by the way, that's the diagram I was describing earlier when you asked me the question about the initials, Homeland Security. And we talked about this earlier, about how increased funding makes it more dangerous for victims right now because per more likely that the perpetrator can get law enforcement to come after her. But um, so in that sense, early identification, everything you guys can do to help identify clients that are qualified for VAWA or T or U, the Violence Against Women Act, U visas or T visas, the sooner the better. Um, by the way, though, if she walks into your door, don't ask her. The first question is, show me your legal status, or are you here legally? Because she probably won't come back. You know, so you really you want to develop a relationship and try to get that information early as possible. But why it's so critical is there have been new um, procedures that the, in the Department of Homeland Security that basically say basically say is if. A